week, some familiar faces in the crowd and uh, some not so, so familiar. Um, I'd like to firstly thank Jill and um, the Young Professionals Network for the invitation, the opportunity to, to come and address you and hopefully engage in a lively uh, Q&A uh, slash exchange of ideas um, um, later on in the evening. Um, I'm, I, I'm really pleased to see um, that there is a Young Professionals Network for starters because uh, I've been coming to events in the, Euro the Institute of European Affairs for many years and I'm sure uh, all of you will have often uh, at different points had the same feeling where you look around the room and you're probably about 50 years younger than the, <laughs> the, 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 the average um, age profile. So, um, so it is important, um, certainly I think if we're to, to foster and cultivate um, a strong uh, sense of being European and why Europe is important to us. And all of that, I think it's important that, that our generation take some responsibility, that we don't just sit back and allow others or wait for others to do it for us, um, but that we, you know, we, we try to become the vanguard ourselves and, and pass it on to, to future generations. Um, so I, if you bear with me, um, there are some remarks which I've, which I've prepared, which I'd like to share with you, some thoughts um, on where we are. Um, and then I'd like to have an exchange, as I said, and hear from you any thoughts, ideas you have, um, because I think that's probably the most enriching, certainly from my point of view and probably from your point of view as well. Um, so I suppose when I was thinking about this, um, you know, I was thinking to myself that for our grandparents' generation at least, and probably for our parents' generation, you know, Europe and, you know, the whole concept of the European project was, was really a no-brainer. I mean, people in Ireland didn't really have to think twice. Um, for the originators of the European concept, the rationale was extremely clear. All of them had suffered greatly and had witnessed unimaginable suffering during World War II. Um, you've heard this before. Um, you probably don't need me to remind you, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I think it is important to put it in context, because it is extraordinary. Um, you know, the people who had seen the very worst in human terms were prepared to literally believe the best of their fellow men. And I think that's quite extraordinary. And the nationalism which caused two world wars on the continent within a period of 35 years um, had to be essentially suppressed for the greater good. Um, and we know the rest, sovereignty was pooled, and um, I certainly, probably along with many of you in the room, have argued that by sharing sovereignty, we have a en enhanced uh, sovereignty, um, certainly in the case of smaller member states. But, but unfortunately, since then, I think there's no doubt that the concept of the European project has lost a lot of its public appeal, um, and we can place, I think, some of the blame, at least, uh, on the generation which um, which ran the union um, before us, so that's probably our parents. Um, and the EU has sadly lost some of its um, ability to engage on a political level with many many of its citizens, if not most of its citizens. And to some, I think the EU means to them, you know, a series of closed doors, of committee rooms full of indistinguishable suits. And it appears to have lost the ability to look out for and protect its citizens. And I think that's something that we need to recapture. And when we consider, for example, that there's 44% youth unemployment in Spain right now, it's hardly any wonder um, that there are question marks over the added value um, which the European Union brings to member states. So for the first time, probably since the start of the Industrial Revolution, our generation is likely to be worse off than the generation of our parents and it's quite a sad reflection on on all of us on on the member states on the eu and probably on the world order um but it's one that i think we have to to look at and analyze and and consider you know new um uh, ways forward i think one of the problems that we have in terms of capturing the imagination when we talk about europe is that we actually have a lot of difficulty in describing it um i think that's one of the essential problems so we know it when we see it. We know um, that Tallinn and Dresden and Zagreb and all of these um, places are part of Europe, but we can't really explain why. Um, so I think we need to find a means of describing um, describing it in terms of you know what Europe is. Maybe it's a continent of moderation, um, whether in climate or topography, or in religion, in philosophy, 
Uh, Tony just talks about an ethical coherence. And I think that there is actually something in that. You know, why do pretty much all Europeans abhor, abhor uh, the death penalty uh, or the subjugation of women, for example? You know, there is a coherence about, um, you know, the things that we can recognise about the European Union, about Europe, about the European project, uh, you know, even if we can't always put words on it, if we can't necessarily describe it. Um, and, you know, we could, we could sit here and talk about economic policy, and I have to say I've been doing that for the last um, 10 months. Um, but I think, you know, there's a broader point to be made. Um, even 20 years ago, when the first steps towards an integrated uh, and enlarged European Union became possible, Europe was a, a bigger place, a more relevant place. It was richer than pretty much anywhere else in the world, and it was among one of the most innovative economies um, on the globe. Uh, and that has changed. We no longer live in a bipolar wor world since the end of the Cold War, um, where Europe was on the winning team. We now live in a multipolar world, and the scale of, of uh, the scale of the game and the scale of the challenge um, has increased uh, immeasurably, pretty much. So it's not only by recognizing our similarities as Europeans and uh, it, it, sorry, it's only by um, recognizing our similarities as Europeans and working together. Um, that we can maintain our place in the world and make our voice heard. Uh, it also means that if we want to see a world order based on the sort of moderation uh, and human respect that I mentioned, uh, which I think identifies Europe, it can only happen with a united Europe, which is determined to play a coherent role um, on the world stage. Today, um, I think it's pretty much nonsense to, to think that any individual um, European country could be a serious player on the economic field against a China or a Brazil or an India. And we've heard that many times, but, but it is reality. Um, it's also not possible for an individual country to deal with the other major challenges that face us, like energy supply and security, climate change, global poverty, all of these big issues which have been on our agenda for decades now. Um, we can't solve them alone. We can only do it by, by cooperating. Um, and the world may be a better place um, than it was at the end of World War II, but it's also much, much more complex. So only the EU, with the correct, coherent and democratic structures, and with ec economic strength, of course, can protect its citizens. Um, and I contend that that's, um, that's very, not just important to, to, um, to a country like Ireland, um, but important to all members of the European Union, and it's in all of our mutual interest to, to make that happen. And for that reason, I'd like to share some, some of the issues that I've been working on the last few months. Um, and I'm not going to talk about European summits um, or um, the, the specific um, lead up to treaties that are in the pipeline and things like that. I'm, I'm going to talk about engaging with the EU agenda. Um, and I think this, certainly from my perspective, um, with my responsibility for coordinating European affairs and government, um, and uh, having witnessed, I think, um, certainly a, a weakening in the position of Ireland within the European Union and vis-a-vis um, -vis the other member states. I think this is really important. In an EU of, 17, uh, of 27, um, we have 27 voices, each trying to articulate a point. Um, and the fact is that if you don't speak, if you're not audible, uh, particularly if you're not coherent, you will be forgotten. Um, that's the nature of it. Things evolve, people move on, everybody has their own agenda. So in order to influence decisions, we have to engage. Um, and my government, when we came into to office, uh, we had an explicit c commitment to restore Ireland's standing as a respected and influential member of the European Union that's stated in our programme for government. And it has literally uh, driven our agenda uh, in respect of European affairs and European engagement since the, the get-go. And members of government have been availing of every opportunity and creating opportunities to meet EU colleagues and representatives of the, of the institutions in order to underline the government's constructive engagement with the um, European agenda and to ensure closer working relationships at a political level across the Union. Um, and aside from meetings and discussions with counterparts at and around my own council, for example, the General Affairs Council, I have very deliberately um, planned as many visits as possible to other member states. Um, and I've met with as many EU counterparts during my visits 
um, and also we've had a, a, quite a quite a, a significant number visiting Ireland. Um, it's inevitable, I suppose, when you have a new government that people want to come and suss you out and uh, and get to know new co counterparts. So it's been a very important process. It's been a two-way process. And um, yes, it is about making our voices heard and securing um, vital national interests, no doubt about that. But it's also, and I think it's important to say this, about contributing to the debate, to the overall all debate, not just from a national um, perspective, um, but it's also about doing our bit to contribute uh, to um, and to ensure that we can secure the future of the, the European project, which is vital to Irish people and to Ireland, but it's also bigger than us. And to underscore how serious the government is about all of this, we transferred responsibility for the coordination of all aspects of EU affairs to the Department of the Taoiseach from Foreign Affairs, because we don't consider this activity to be foreign affairs. We, we Rather, we consider it to be an integral uh, part of the day-to-day -day domestic agenda of the Irish government. And I think that was a very important symbolic move, also a very important pra practical move, um, which I think um, speaks volumes. Um, it's also important that we engage effectively um, and meaningfully with the EU agenda because Ireland is going to hold the presidency of the um, European Council for the seventh time during the first half of 2013. And I'm sure you're all aware of this, but um, it falls on, on my lap in terms of um, the preparation. So it's something that I'm literally talking about 24-7 at the moment. I don't know how many briefings I've done on it at this stage. Um, but it is hugely important. It's a great opportunity. And it's also going to coincide, interestingly, with the 40th anniversary of Ireland's accession to the European Union. So hopefully it'll be a cause to celebrate. And uh, I certainly envisage um, opportunities for us to, to showcase what's what's worked, what's been good, um, and what has helped enhance Ireland uh, and Irish people um, uh, as a society since we joined. We joined with um, Denmark, of course, who've just taken over the presidency, and the UK, who have always had a slightly different um, path, um, shall we say, on the European um, uh, journey than we have. But um, that's not to say that we can't um, cooperate on, on lots of issues. A key factor um, in, in the positive perception of Ireland in Europe has been uh, the reputation which we have developed painstakingly, I would say, over the past four decades for impartial and effective presidencies. And, you know, all governments, all parties have contributed to that in Irish society. And I think it's something that we can be very, very proud of. It's a good legacy. Um, um, and just to give an example of, you know, the key role that we have played in some instances, uh, we played a very important role, for example, in the reunification of the European continent. And that's something we can be proud of. During our 1990 presidency, Ireland oversaw um, the approach to German reunification. Um, and that's certainly a legacy of which I'm proud and one that we've probably forgotten by and large in this country. And again, in 2004, I think most of us um, are young enough to remember at least this much, um, that Ireland held the Day of Welcomes here in Dublin at Oris and Uthoron, um, which marked the accession of the 10 new member states um, and saw the EU expand to uh, Eastern and cent uh, Central uh, Europe, which I, I think was a, a really momentous um, day uh, in, the, in the context of everything that had gone before, um, not just the Cold War, but going right back to uh, the, the, the beginning of, of, um, of the 20th century. So our task for the presidency in 2013, um, in my view, is probably the greatest challenge to date for this country. Um, and it will be to run a presidency that contributes to the renewal of the European project um, after what has been a traumatic period. And let's face it, probably will continue to be a traumatic period right up, right up to and possibly even during the, the Irish presidency. So that's going to be a huge task. And, you know, I'd be interested to hear from you this evening about how we can do that if you have ideas um, or thoughts on it. Um, it's going to be a presidency that focuses on growth and jobs, a presidency that puts prosperity back on the European agenda, uh, and above all, um, we intend that it will be a presidency that recognises that the European Union is about the prosperity and security of its people. And therefore, for the Union to have legitimacy, its people have to be prosperous and secure. Um, and that's something that I think is, um, you know, I think in a historical context, when you look back over the last 40 years, you can say certainly you know, it has been a success and um, comparatively we're all much better off and we're all much safer and there's peace on the continent. But in the short term, in, in terms of our short term memories, I think it's a much bigger challenge because our generation don't remember that. So um, 
Um, I think, you know, it presents an exciting opportunity, but also a very significant challenge. Um, and then just moving on, because of the complexity of the EU, there's, there's certainly a tendency to neglect the human element of the European institutions, um, which I might um, just mention for, for, for a brief moment. Uh, and to ignore, I think, um, the, the human element of the European institutions is to ignore the central role that Irish men and women play in the success of the European project. Uh, and I'm not talking about here in the domestic scene, but rather in Brussels and the various institutions in other parts of Europe. Uh, in fact, here in Ireland, I think we have a really proud um, tradition of contributing to the workings of the EU through its institutions. Irish people were and still are, in my experience, very highly regarded for their efficiency, impartiality and um, I think we can all be proud of our legendary networking skills. Um, and they have devoted many hours, and indeed, you know, we all probably come across them, many people who've devoted their entire lives to working um, in the European Union. And it is a, a very selfless contribution, um, which has been very, very important to building the institutions and indeed building the ideas that have, have helped to foster um, Europe and the European project and the European identity. Um, there have only been five Secretaries General of the European Commission, and of these two have been Irish. I think that's a pretty spectacular outcome for, for a tiny country such as our, ours. Um, the cur current Secretary General, as you know, is Catherine Day. I think she addressed the Institute not that long ago. Um, prior to her was David O'Sullivan, who is now the um, uh, Chief Operations Officer um, with the uh, EEAS, the European External Action Service. Um, so two key uh, influencer, influencers and um, pivotal people um, present at all of the key negotiations and so on. Um, and very important link for the Irish government as well. Well, of course, they're there guarding the treaties and doing you know, their constitutional uh, um, um, duties. Um, they do, of course, still look out for, for Ireland and for the national interests. So they're a very important uh, conduit for us and a very important point of contact. And... Uh, it's quite clear that currently Ireland is quite well represented um, at the, the middle and upper management levels of the institutions, but there are absolutely insufficient numbers of, uh, of officials of Irish nationality at the more junior grades. So this is a real cause for concern. Um, and when you take into account that a lot of the senior officials, the kind of 1973 generation, are soon um, likely to retire, um, we're going to find that numbers will fall very dramatically in the very near future. Um, so I suppose one of the tasks for me is to remind young Irish people that there are opportunities for Irish professionals to seek employment in Brussels and elsewhere. Um, in the next seven years, the European Parliament, for example, is going to renew nearly 50% of its staff. So why shouldn't uh, you know, a respectable number of them be Irish? Uh, that has to be our objective. As I mentioned, one of the objectives of the government is to boost Ireland's engagement with the EU at every level and having a steady flow of Irish um, high quality candidates um, entering the EU institutions is not just beneficial for the EU, but it's beneficial for us as well. Um, so with that, that in mind, the Department of the Taoiseach and the Department of Foreign Affairs have been working with a, a range of partners um, to encourage Irish candidates to apply for EU uh, level career opportunities. And they've set up a mailing list. And if you're interested, the email address is eujobs at taoiseach.ie. Um, and next month, I'm going to be launching a recruitment campaign to raise awareness of the career opportunities that are available to young Irish people. And, you know, the way I think about this is that we all know so many people who have emigrated to Canada, uh, to Australia, to New Zealand um, and to the UK. We tend to go to English speaking countries. I think we're a little bit intimidated by you know, the prospect of the concours, the competition, the language requirements and so on. I think we need to get over it. Um, and certainly um, it's going to be uh, very much part of our campaign to encourage young Irish people to brush up on their language skills. It's not that difficult and to go for it and to see opportunities. And always remember, if you're in Brussels, you're a lot closer to home than you are if you're in Sydney or, um, or Quebec or wherever. Um, so the, the campaign which we're launching is going to be called originally The EU Needs You. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I will be taking it to every third level institution in the country. We're building relations at the moment with, you know, uh, all sorts of sectors in, in colleges who are interested, be it European study, studies, be it law, be it business, whatever. Um, so there's a great opportunity there and we're involving the European movement, the commission and all, all of the stakeholders here um, in Dublin uh, in planning that campaign. So I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, 
Irish gra graduates are highly sought after in the EU institutions. So, you know, I hope that some of you might consider um, careers in the European institutions um, in, in, in future and, you know, contribute in the way that the likes of Catherine Day and David O'Sullivan and many, many others have done. Um, I think another good example of um, you know, the edu educational benefits and I suppose part of free movement as well um, is that you know, three million young people have benefited um, um, from, from um, opportunities to study in other countries through the Erasmus programme and so on. Um, I know I'm sure many of you in the room have, have, have benefited from that project as well that was launched by Peter Sutherland when he was commissioner, which is interesting. Um, our Irish um, ambassador, our commissioner. Um, and I think it's a good example of how Ireland's membership of the EU has opened up our, our opportunities, I suppose, for young Irish um, students and ultimately for, for young Irish profession, professionals, which I hope is of um, uh, relevance to you. Um, but it's also created opportunities for young professionals at home. And I think um, one example here is, well, there are quite a few um, women in the audience and um, it's not that long ago uh, that women, you know, any woman working in the public sector had to give up her job when she got married. Um, that was forcibly dropped by the Irish government when we joined the, the EU um, because, um, because of the um, equality of opportunity legislation that was in place, which we had to comply with when we joined. So I think it's a good example, a tangible example of, you know, how we have benefited um, particularly young people, particularly young women have benefited from our membership. And there are so many other examples, but I think it's just um, it's one that strikes me looking around the room. Um, so I'm going to conclude um, because I know I'm going on, but um, <coughs> but I just want to say, you know, I think I'm always struck by the fact that we, we don't really consider too often how exceptional the EU is. I was at um, a conference, a uh, Euro-Asia conference um, months ago, last June I think it was, and Kevin Rudd, the Australian Foreign Minister, was there, uh, former Prime Minister, and he was saying, you know, he was really sort of, I think, driving home a point which we in Europe never really consider, which is that, you know, we spend so much time looking inwards, navel-gazing, criticising ourselves, um, looking for the negatives in in our, our unique construction, the European Union. Um, and he was saying, you know, in Asia, which is where they are, you know, if they could have even one hundredth of the level of cooperation that we have, they would see it as an enormous bonus. They envy us. They look at uh, the European Union and they say, wow, you know, that's such an amazing political uh, and social construct, which has by and large been so hugely successful. Of course, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But they envy it. And he was saying, you know, stop the self-flagellation and get on with it and start appreciating what you do well more. And I think we could learn a lot from, from that sort of um, advice. Um, Yeats spoke of great hatred, little room for our own troubles in Ireland. And I think, you know, he could have been speaking about the, the European continent and its history. Um, yet in the middle of the last century, something changed. And I think, you know, this is something we have to remind ourselves of, particularly because we weren't around, um, that hard-fought consensus displaced um, all-too-easy conflict. And what has developed really is exceptional, and it's to be cherished, and it's something that we have to fight for and hold on to. Europeans often seem, seem unaware of the concrete and tangible change that the project has affected on its borders. Um, in the Western Balkans today, um, for example, Europeans, Irish men and women, amongst all others, um, are working together to heal the divisions of the bloody and awful conflict um, that occurred there. And although progress is slow, there is progress, and that's to be appreciated. And that is due in, in very large part uh, to the intervention and the work of the European Union. Uh, and we Irish, I think, know more than, more than most that there's nothing greater um, that we can make than peace. Nothing more fragile, obviously, but also nothing more powerful um, when you achieve it. And it's worth fighting for and it's worth treasuring. Um, and since the inception of the European project, Europeans have been doing just that. So I think, you know, from Ireland's point of view, we have been part of it. We are part of it. And I think that's something that we can be extremely proud of. Thank you. Thank you.